In four hours on Sunday night, the WWE attempted to set out to make SummerSlam the WrestleMania of the summer. Did they get the job done? Well, <laughs> one of the things you come to expect out of a WrestleMania is celebrity involvement and hopefully big name celebrity involvement. If you're going to make SummerSlam the WrestleMania of the summer, it would make sense to have that in kind as well. And to be fair to the WWE, they had that with Jon Stewart. Stephen Amell, eh, that's debatable. But what's really debatable to me is the decision to basically only announce Jon Stewart's involvement as the host of SummerSlam six days before the actual show. We devoted more time to building up to the lesser star in Stephen Amell. All the while, you're looking at Jon Stewart, a New York-based guy who has reason to be on the show because he's a huge wrestling fan, because of his previous involvement with Seth Rollins, and frankly, the fact that now that his gig on Comedy Central has ended, people are wondering what the hell this guy's going to do next. There's no more Daily Show. What's Jon Stewart going to do? And granted, WWE got him involved in a big way. And more on that in a little bit. But part of the deal with WrestleMania is you sit there and you spend weeks, if not months, building up to the celebrity involvement, hopefully in a good way, for good celebrity involvement, but it was like Jon Stewart was just a throw-in, and I didn't understand that at all. Nothing says a big-time special event, a WrestleMania of the summer, like kicking it off with Randy Orton versus Sheamus. Seriously, Randy Orton versus Sheamus kicked off a Big Four pay-per-view. <laughs> I mean, I just really zoned out on this match, and I'm sure I'm not the only one. This really should have been the one match on the card that had that really quick snap finish like I talked about the last time these two faced on a pay-per-view. With that said, at least they tried to get Sheamus some type of heel heat, some type of reaction, thank God. And holy hell, the Money in the Bank winner actually goes over at a Big Four pay-per-view against a significant opponent like Randy Orton. Oh-ho! Are you not entertained? No, we are not entertained. Because Seamus looks stupid and is fucking dumb. We know who the real star is. And that is Randall Keith Orton. Yay! Yay! Randall Keith Orton is number one. Yay! Yay! <laughs> Now, while I understand the WWE views Randy Orton versus Sheamus as a clash between colors, let's talk about some real color, and let's talk about the black man taking over SummerSlam. I mean, I'm a fan of Kofi, and I'm glad he's taking this and running with it, but that clapping and skipping that he does is just a little bit on the questionable side. Oh, but wait, there's more. Big E, Big E, gotta do the Big E, Big E, Big E, gotta do the Big E, Big E, Big E, gotta do the Big E. So let me get this straight. Kofi does the flamboyant clapping, Big E does the groin thrusting, and the Xavier Woods does the believable blabble talking. Well, at least if anything else, he does one thing good. And by God, these guys have taken something that has no business getting over, and they've made it fucking work. And you want to know why? Because. New Day Rocks. New Day Rocks. New Day Rocks. As you can tell, I had quite a bit of fun with the tag title four-way. I probably would have enjoyed it even more if it didn't feel like a match that I've gotten on Raw repeatedly in some way, shape, form, or configuration. Just saying. But you see, WWE, the white fans like to cheer for the black guys, too, as you could clearly see in this freaking match. Titus O'Neil over... The New Day freaking over. Give him a push. Let's see what happens. Yeah, I'm sure somebody after this went up to Vince and Kevin Dunn and suggested that, hey, look at that big E guy. Everything we put him in, he finds a way to stand out. He's got that special it factor. Maybe someday he could be the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. I wonder what Vince and Kevin Dunn thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> Listen 
isn't our brother. It just wouldn't feel like the WrestleMania of the summer if we didn't have Hulk Hogan, brother. Oh, God. Who let him in here? That's right, brother. It's been a tumultuous couple of weeks for me, dude. And I think I've gotten a bad rap, brother. Well, you know, Hulk, you got the bad rap. Because you deserve the bad rap. I don't care if you said it in private or not. What you said was ridiculous and you deserve all of the heat that you get. Well, I assure you, brother, that those comments were taken out of context, brother. And furthermore, who gave any permission to record what I said, brother? But I realized the error of my ways and I've come to make things right, brother. Well, that's good. I mean, I'm glad to hear that, you know? Maybe we've got this whole thing all wrong, people, and maybe we should hear the Hulkster out for a moment. That's right, brother. I feel terrible about what happened, dude, and I take full responsibility and accountability. Because at the end of the day, brother, there's just no place for that type of thinking in today's modern society, dude. And I was just sitting there watching the WWE SummerSlam on the WWE Network, brother, with my son Nick. And I was telling him how much of a fan of the black wrestlers I am, brother. Titus O'Neil, Big E. Oh my God, these guys have money written all over them, dude. If the Hulkster was 20 years younger, I'd give them a run for their money. And we'd make money all over the place, even in the Pontiac Superdome, dude. Oh wait, is that the Mercedes-Benz Silverdome, brother? Oh, I don't know. The point is, brother, is that my daughter, Brooke, is it the only Balea family member that can show love to the black man, brother? Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear it since you're kind of like a childhood hero of mine. And, you know, I'm a huge fan of the black man getting an opportunity in the WWE, perhaps winning the freaking main world title someday. It's good to hear that a person I've looked up to for so many years is on board with all this. Well, the truth is, brother, is that in a couple of weeks, the Hulkster is looking to enter the Gus Macker down here in Tampa, brother. And I was just wondering if Big E and Kofi and Titus might be available to team up with the Hulkster, brother. We can run and rule and reign supreme all over the Gus Macker, brother. Oh, God. You do realize, Hulkster, that not every black man is good at basketball. That is a bad and ridiculous stereotype. Well, I know that's true, brother. Just look at the Brooklyn Nets who play in the Barclays Center, brother. Yeah, he's kind of got a point there. That's right, brother. I told you the Hulkster isn't racist, brother. Because if anything, I'm just like them, dude. Because everybody's hating against me now because of the color of my skin. They're discriminating against me in WWE because I'm a white man that popped off at the mouth when I shouldn't have, brother. And therefore, that makes me kind of like an honorary black man. In fact, I can't wait until I get my first DWB, dude. In no way, shape, or freaking form do you understand what it's like to be a black man, Hulkster. And in no way, shape, or form is anybody discriminating against you because of the color of your skin. Please, for the love of God, do us all a favor and just shut the hell up! before anybody starts to think any worse of you or you stick your foot in your mouth any more than you already have. Well, maybe you've got a point there, dude. Uh, but, but seriously, would you reach out to them and let them know, brother, because we can reign over the Tampa Gus Macker, brother. Let them know that I'm going to have all the Popeyes they can eat, dude. Stop, 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 stop! That is horrible. Enough! Not every black man loves fried chicken. That's ridiculous. Well, that does remind me, I could go for a three-piece meal right about now. Anyways, I apologize for all of that. You give a guy a forum, and he sticks his foot in his mouth. That's the last time you're going to see the Hulkster, the last time you're going to hear about the Hulkster on this channel, brother. Let's talk about the rest of SummerSlam. I really don't get Dolph Ziggler versus Rusev or anything involving this being on SummerSlam. I really don't. I don't understand what the hell Summer Rae and Lana were wearing. Lana looked fucking ridiculous. I don't know what the hell type of Nydia white trash shit she pulled out of the WWE's wardrobe. And Summer Rae looked like an unintentional cheap whore. Now, you get to this whole thing. You've been doing it for weeks with Rusev and Summer Rae and Lana. 
And now you awkwardly kind of throw Ziggler into the mix at the last moment like this is supposed to be some big deal. To me, this would have worked so much better if you would have, A, done the mixed tag is what you should have fucking done, or B, what you had really been building up to was a match between Summer Rae and Lana at this show, and then when Rusev tries to get involved, then you have the big spectacular return of Dolph Ziggler. This match being Dolph Ziggler versus Rusev was stupid because this is the last thing anybody expected to see or frankly wanted to see was the last thing WWE was building to. And then on top of that, you throw in that ridiculous fucking double countout finish. Fucking please. Now, uh, granted, I get it. I understand it. I agree with it. If you're trying to make SummerSlam the WrestleMania of the summer, that means you need to get a huge, massive quantity of mainstream exposure, particularly a lot more than you would usually get. All the stuff and coverage you're getting from ESPN throughout the week leading up to the show, really, really good. You know, involving Jon Stewart, again, really, really good. And even throwing in somebody like a Stephen Amell, really good. These are things that help to make it feel like more than just a regular pay-per-view. Feel like it's a big four pay-per-view. Feel like it's the huge show of the summer. And granted, I thought Stephen Amell was good in this Hollywood tag match, as I'll call it. You know, they limited what he did, but what he did mattered. The crowd got into it, and that was good. I just think it's a real shame here that Neville, who's been somebody that's slowly been getting over organically in the right way, comes to SummerSlam, and he's playing Robin to Stephen Amell's Green Arrow and Stardust, whatever the freaking hell he's doing. It was That's just my one complaint about it, was that Neville's taking a back seat here. I wanted him to have a featured match at SummerSlam. I just didn't want it to be this featured match at SummerSlam. The IC title triple threat was a fucking joke and a half. It really was, and that doesn't really surprise me. Because the whole dynamics of the feud between Ryback, Miz, and Big Show heading up to this match were kind of off and kind of frankly stupid. So it makes sense that this match would ultimately end up being stupid. Now, they booked the Big Show properly throughout. And what The Miz was doing in terms of trying to be that snake in the grass that would pounce when the opportunity presents itself made a lot of sense. But then we get the finish. Now, granted, this wasn't the first stupid finish of the night. And it wasn't the last stupid finish of the night. And it wasn't the stupidest finish of the night. But it definitely was a stupid finish nonetheless. Ryback is supposed to be this big fucking powerhouse. Why is he winning in the fashion in which Miz was trying to win in the entire fucking match. Speaking of celebrity involvement, I, I really wish I could have found a way with this whole family feud crap between the remnants of the Shield and the Wyatt family to involve Steve Harvey. I'm just saying, that, that could have been something. I don't know how it would work. I don't even know if it matters how it would have worked. Just throw them in there somewhere. But nonetheless, I really like the way this tag match started. Yes, it was yet another tag match. It felt like Survivor Series this show did in a lot of ways. Teddy Long, I'm sure, was sitting there having one big circle jerk watching this on the WWE Network. But I love the fact that it started off in such a kind of up-tempo type of physical brawling style. It didn't start off as just a regular wrestling match. It shouldn't have started off as just a regular wrestling match, and that's good. What I don't understand, though, is why people are still booing Roman Reigns. Yes, you could be pissed still about the fact that he won the 2015 Royal Rumble, but a lot of you loved the main event of WrestleMania 31, and that was even before Seth Rollins cashed in. He got screwed over there, storyline-wise. He got screwed over at Money in the Bank. It's not exactly like Bray Wyatt's kicking ass and taking names in terms of his character right now. I mean, he's in a tag match against the Wyatt family at SummerSlam. Let's kind of get over it. He's not wrestling for the title. He's not holding the Money in the Bank briefcase. Frankly, he's nowhere near the main event scene. In a lot of ways, you could see another future star and the WWE dropping the ball on him. He's at, at that point in time now. He has gotten better. I think you have to agree at least a little bit, even if you're a hardcore Roman Reigns critic, that maybe it's time to start redirecting your energies at other places and hating on other things. I'm just saying. And I guess this match was okay. Yeah, the finish was kind of slow and kind of telegraphed. But I wasn't expecting greatness out of this. Daddy's right. I'm tired of all these Roman haters. Just because he's bigger than you. 
stronger than you, more athletic than you, prettier than you, and a better man than you'll ever be. It doesn't mean you have the right to hate on him. He's not even the champion right now, even though he should be. Or at the worst, he's not even the Money in the Bank winner, which he most certainly should have been. This was a revenge situation, and of course Roman was going to win, because of Roman Reigns rules. Hell yeah, bitches. And fuck all these haters hating on my Samoan stud muffin. Roman, love yous. Don't listen to the haters, Roman. You're still the man. And come WrestleMania 32, you're going to be the WWE World Heavyweight Champion. Love you, Romans. Call me. Roman, love yous. Call me. Well, heading into this title versus title match between Seth Rollins and John Cena, I'll admit, I had no clue what type of finish they were going to come up with. I had no clue if they even had a finish. Well, they got themselves an out, as the WWE seems to be really adept at doing. And I understand a lot of you are excited about this. But I'm going to pump the brakes here for just a second. First of all, what the fuck was Seth Rollins wearing? He looked like a cross between the White Power Ranger, Jason David Frank, and fucking Mordecai. It's like the WWE again had to clear out the old wardrobe. They did it with Lana with her idiot white trash gear earlier in the night. And they're doing it here again with Seth Rollins literally coming out looking like Mordecai. What the fuck was that? And then you get this match. It's more of the same old stuff in terms of it's a spot to get to a spot to get to a spot. I know a lot of people think that's great and that's fine and good. But what happened to the art of actually telling a story in the fucking match? You know, if I just wanted to watch flips and kicks, I'd go watch an independent show and not worry about storytelling. Part of the thing I come to WWE for, I don't know why anymore, because they're nothing more than a glorified independent show with much larger production budgets. I expect to see some characters. I expect to see some interesting, compelling characters and character development and interesting and compelling stories and storytelling, especially in the fucking matches. But then we get to the finish. And here comes John freaking Stewart in the most telegraphed way possible as you would sit there and logically think, hey, him and Seth Rollins have had a lot of beat. You'll set it up and you'll really tease like he's going to hit Seth Rollins and maybe he actually will hit Seth Rollins. But we send John Stewart out there and as soon as he gets out there, you realize immediately based off the way he's acting and setting it up that apparently acting is not his forte. He needs to stick to doing satire because that's what he's damn good at. He's telegraphing the finish the whole time that he's going to hit freaking Cena. And then he hits freaking Cena and this shit makes absolutely no fucking sense. Similar to Tyson, at the end of WrestleMania 14, he's aligned with DX the entire time. And all of a sudden he's popping up fucking Shawn Michaels in the mouth to reveal an Austin 316 shirt and he's celebrating with freaking Austin. It makes no fucking sense. And this finish made absolutely no fucking sense. While I understand it's a surprise on a lot of you because Cena didn't win the title, view it as a really good surprise, and I get that. Always remember at the end of the day, now they found their excuse to get the U.S. title off of Cena, meaning that he has the reason and excuse now to go back after the world title once again. And you know how this story usually plays out and usually goes, and it ends up not being good for you. I mean, this made absolutely no fucking sense whatsoever. It's a cool moment in a way, and it's a good opportunity to get the U.S. title off of Cena because God knows who the fuck else is going to beat him. But think about it. It took a chair shot in the gut from a fucking comedian for John Cena to lose the U.S. title to the WWE World Heavyweight Champion Seth Rollins. The guy who for months had been going back and forth with and feuding with the freaking comic that just hit John Cena in the gut with a tear. This shit makes absolutely no fucking sense. It is completely fucking stupid. And I hope for those of you that are celebrating now that at the next pay-per-view night of champions, if and when Cena wins that title for the 16th time, he does it with a figure four and I come on here and say, ha ha ha, motherfucker, fuck you, that's what you get. Because this shit was stupid. What a stupid fucking finish. But of course, it wasn't the last stupid finish of the night. But 
You thought Seth Rollins was going to win clean? <laughs> what, you thought the WWE would do a better job of building up Jon Stewart and his appearance and put more emphasis into the match between Cena and Rollins instead of him worried about Taker and Lesnar so damn much, knowing that he's going to end up getting involved in Cena and Rollins anyways? <laughs> What now? You think that this means that Cena's not going to get that title and he's not going to tie Ric Flair? <laughs> now let me get this straight. Sasha Banks tears the house down at that NXT show the previous night. So you've got this big three on three on three Divas tag match. This is supposed to be a big moment for the Divas division. The Divas revolution coming to fruition at SummerSlam. Oh, baby. So somebody decided it was a good fucking idea to take easily the best in-ring performer you have in that women's division in Sasha Banks and eliminate her early. That just lets you know how everything was going to go fucking downhill from there. This whole match and concept is fucking stupid. It's all nothing more than a stalling tactic to get Nikki Bella to surpass AJ Lee for the longest Divas title reign because the WWE is that petty and is that stupid. This match was crap. It was way too fucking long. Featuring far too much Becky Lynch who looks like she got hit in the face with the ugly stick and the ugly stick fucking lost. And we give her the fucking... Oh, my Christ almighty. This was just shit. This is exactly the same type of shit you would come to expect out of the Divas division over the past several years. Revolution, my ass. Personally, my favorite match of the night was Kevin Owens versus Cesaro. The thought of these two guys going on after John Cena and the WWE World Heavyweight Champion... Kind of brought a smile to my face. Think about it. That title versus title match, mid-carded SummerSlam. You're trying to make this the WrestleMania of the freaking summer, and you had your world title versus U.S. title match, freaking mid-card. Anyways, Kevin Owens, Cesaro. Good match. Had fun. Cesaro looked good. Owens looked good. Owens goes over clean. You know, no matter what, I can sit there and say, I hate to see Cesaro lose, or I would hate to see the Owens character lose. But somebody won. Somebody won decisively. Somebody won clean at the culmination of a, what I thought was a solid match. I have no real other complaints. This match fucking semi made it that in SummerSlam. I put a smile on my face, damn it. Oh my god, Marcus Smart here. And what a weekend of professional wrestling the WWE put on for me in New York City. NXT, awesome. Bailey versus Sasha Banks, match of the year. Kevin Owens, Finn Balor, NXT title, all types of metal mayhem and pandemonium chaos, awesome. And then we get to SummerSlam. Oh, we want Lana. You're dang right, we want Lana. And I got to see Dolph Ziggler even more importantly. Kevin Owens versus Cesaro was a semi-main event in another awesome match. And then Seth Rollins channeled his inner white power ranger, it's true. And he beat John Cena clean. He didn't need John Stewart. John Stewart realizes that Seth Rollins is the future of the WWE. Until Daniel Bryan comes back. Because he's the best motherfucker wrestler in the world. NXT was awesome. SummerSlam was awesome. And if you don't agree with me, stick it up your ass. And now we get to the main event. The match of this show was built on the back of. And in the immortal words of our good friend B-Rad, finally we get this match. The Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar in a match that's too big for WrestleMania. <laughs> if this match here at SummerSlam was too big for WrestleMania, what's that mean for the next match that these two guys have? Is it going to be on the fucking moon? <laughs> now, I'll admit, I've actually been getting out a kick out of this old grumpy man taker. The one that's pissed at Brock Lesnar because his dog pooped in his yard. 
the one that apparently watched one too many episodes of King of the Hill, especially the episode of Bobby Hill taking the women's self-defense class, so he likes to go around now kicking people in the testicles. That's my purse, I don't know you. I love this no-gives-a-fuck taker. I really do. It ain't heel. You ain't turning fucking take or heel. Give me a fucking break. It's just something different. I'm enjoying it. I'm trying to find a reason to get behind Taker still being on a pay-per-view, still being on my TV. And this is what I got, damn it. So don't take it away from me. I really like, though, how this match started. It started off again as a brawl, as a free-for-all like the fuck it should have been. And if they were going to go to that level... And this match was too big for WrestleMania. Can somebody please answer me why the fuck this wasn't a street fight, a hell in a cell, an unsanctioned match, something. I don't get it. It's too big for WrestleMania, yet it's just a standard wrestling match. With all of the history there, the fact that Taker's never beat Brock Lesnar, Brock Lesnar ended the streak, Taker wants his revenge in the way that he's seeking his revenge, you would have thought that would have meant some type of big-time stipulation. And instead, we got nothing. Now, in a lot of ways, this match was what I would have hoped the WrestleMania 30 match was. The build-up to this match was so much better than the WrestleMania 30 build-up. And frankly, until the finish, the match was far and away better than the match at WrestleMania 30. It was faster-moving. It just flowed better. It gelled better. I thought both guys were on their game better. It was good. I was enjoying it. But again, we got to the finish. <laughs> and let's set the record straight about this finish. The Undertaker did not tap out. That was a tombstone Thigh torture technique that he learned at his local dojo in the free time, building up to this match at SummerSlam. That was too big for WrestleMania with Brock Lesnar. He didn't tap! He didn't tap! You damn it! It was a tombstone thigh torture technique from Taker. It's T to the fifth power, motherfucker! But seriously, who the fuck booked this finish? Why did so many matches on this show have to have such ridiculous finishes? It was just dumb. The IC Triple Threat match, that finish was stupid. The Ziggler Rusev double countout was fucking dumb. Title versus title winner take all, that finish was stupid. It made absolutely no fucking sense. And then you get to the big match of it all, the one match you would think that would be able to overcome it, that you would stay away from it, and you do this shit. And I saw somebody, I think it was Hurricane Helms, his dumbass sitting there talking about on Twitter. Oh, if it, you, it worked, and it worked, it means it's a work, and it worked. And no, it's fucking stupid. It's the WWE outthinking themselves and overthinking the scenario and the situation. This is fucking stupid. Stupid is stupid. And this was fucking stupid. No, this does not make Brock Lesnar look better. No, this does not protect Taker. It just looks fucking stupid. This is just like a movie or a TV show. If most of the body is good, but the finish is shit, then you usually remember that it's shit and it sucked and you hate it. That's exactly what this was. I was, in a lot of ways, enjoying SummerSlam. And in a sick, sadistic way, I still did because of the finish and people's reactions to the finish. But this finish was fucking stupid. This is how you chose to finish off such an important match is with some dumb dick Dusty finish that even Dusty wouldn't have fucking done because, again, it made absolutely no fucking sense. This is so bad on so many different levels. As fans, we deserve better. And frankly, The Undertaker and Brock Lesnar in the story and issue and both performers most certainly deserved better. All of this now, so that way we can get to WrestleMania 32 and live via satellite. It's Taker Lesnar 3 from the motherfucking dark side of the moon. <laughs> In theory, this is a show that I should have liked a whole lot more than I actually did. 
Part of the reason I think for that is that when I tune into Raw for three hours every Monday night and the show is so dominated by in-ring action, it's hard for me to feel like the show is going to be anything different when I watch a four-hour pay-per-view when you use the fucking Raw set and it's pretty much all in-ring action. There's not a lot to spice it up, break up the monotony. It's just match, video package, match, video package, match, video package. You, you get the freaking formula. We get the drill. But, I mean, you know, the black man reigns supreme in the tag title match. So, I got to like that. Owen Cesaro had a good match. Semi-main event of the show. Owens won. I should be happy about that. John Cena didn't walk out the champion. I should really be freaking about happy about that. And The Undertaker kicked Brock Lesnar's ass. I should be really excited about that. But I'm just kind of eh. Eh. Lots of stupid finishes, especially the main event. But frankly, the other major marquee match as well, and other matches throughout the night, some of the other matches were forgettable or I just didn't care about. This is kind of a middle-of-the-road show. But that's funny. In a lot of ways, this felt like a Survivor Series from maybe 15 years ago or a WrestleMania in that WrestleMania 25 to 27 type of stretch. So in some ways, if the WWE did set out to make this feel like the WrestleMania this summer, <laughs> mission accomplished. But maybe they shouldn't be uh, so proud about what they did and tapping themselves on the back. Because yes, while you got a lot of mainstream exposure and coverage out of this, like I tune, tune out into ESPN on Monday morning to catch out highlights from the night before, and there's freaking SummerSlam talk, and there's the coach. You know, that's good. Uh, but, you know, does this really satisfy the fans? And maybe it did. I just, I've seen far, far worse recently out of the WWE, don't get me wrong. It's just, it wasn't that far away from being a whole lot better. And it could have been a whole lot better. And it should have been a whole lot better. And ultimately, the reason it wasn't better is because the WWE just can't help themselves and can't stay out of their own freaking way. Oh, and one more thing. You remember this night, Brock? You remember this travesty? You remember this abomination? You remember this grave injustice? That was WrestleMania 30, and you ending The Undertaker's streak? I know I haven't forgotten. I know a lot of other fans haven't forgotten. And I know most importantly of all, The Undertaker never forgot it. He just bided his time. He waited for his chance. He waited for his opportunity. He waited for his moment. And when he saw that moment, he pounced, damn it! I bet this is the last time you're going to let your wife Sable take your shih tzu doodle and let him poop all over the Undertaker's yard. I bet that's the last time that you try to take Michelle McCool's purse because otherwise the Undertaker, once again, is going to freaking kick you square in the freaking testicles. But the truth of the matter is, is that the better man won. And I don't want to hear your excuses. I don't want to hear about this and he tapped out. No, God damn it! once again, it was a tombstone Thigh torture technique taker style. He learned it from his local dojo. Same as you apparently learned how to only do freaking suplexes and kimuras at your fucking dojo. The Undertaker kicked your ass. He pushed your shit in. And if you don't like it, and your freaking fans don't like it, well, I got one thing to say to you. The Undertaker won, bitch. As far as I'm concerned, this erases the previous loss at WrestleMania 30. The streak is now intact. 23-0. And if you want some, bitch, come get some. Because Undertaker and I will be there at WrestleMania 32, live via satellite, from the dark side of the moon, in a match that's too big for planet Earth to hold, The Undertaker versus Brock Lesnar 3. You want some, come get some, because Taker will take you to school, old school, and he'll beat your ass just like he beat your ass here at SummerSlam. <laughs>